Good morning, everybody. We're just about to start <laughs> the long awaited session, right? <laughs> okay. So, welcome. I'm actually going to kick it off to Ruchira because I'm going to start off. But um, thank you so much for waking up so early. I hope that breakfast helped lower you here, but I hope that the subject was even more interesting. So, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to have a very exciting session, actually. Um, this is a first for us, uh, and we hope to do many more. Uh, my name is Rania Alasawi. I work with the social behavior change team in New York, uh, in the headquarters team. Um, now global, but uh, previously at country offices for my entire career before I joined the global team. We're very pleased to be here. I lead on partnerships with the team. And uh, today we're going to be talking about some of the new work that we're getting into more deeply. And I'm going to pass over to my co-moderator and co-conspirator, I call her, Ruchira, to introduce herself. Over to you, Ruchira. Thank you so much, Anya. Good morning. Can we have that louder? <laughs> Just for the benefit of the people who've joined us super late or super early, can we say good morning to the speakers online? <laughs> speakers, can we ask you to have your videos on if possible so that we all can see your bright and smiling faces? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And Saurabh, we want to see you too. <laughs> we have Carlotta. Hi, we Carlotta. Saurabh, who's joining us from India. And we're going to come to our speakers very soon. But uh, once again, thank you so much for being here this morning. Very early, still dark, after what was a very, very exciting night. I don't know how many of you got the sleep amidst the noise and the commotion. <laughs> Um, but all for a good cause, all for a good cause. So thank you so much for being here this morning. My name is Ruchira, and I work with UNICEF uh, now for 11 years, uh, but my entire career, which has been over 25 years, I've been working on the role of the private sector in contributing to development. Um, at UNICEF, I work with a very exciting team called um, Business Engagement and Child Rights, and our mission is to get UNICEF um, future ready to be engaging with the business sector as equal stakeholders, just as we do with the governments, with civil societies. Working with the private sector is not new to UNICEF. There's a lot of work that we've been doing for decades now um, in partnering and engaging with the private sector, but today's session is not about UNICEF. Today's session is gonna be about an exciting conversation that we want to build around this very interesting area um, around social and behavior change, and what is it that the private sector has been doing and has been contributing and can do, um, you know, moving forward. And we're going to unpack some of these questions and conversations as we move um, into the session today. The session is about uh, 19 minutes. We are 10 minutes into that already. We will keep time aside to have a conversation with the audience. So um, bear with us. Keep your questions handy. Note them down, and at the end of the conversation with our lovely speakers, we will come to you and build it a little bit further. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Rania to get us started. And just because it's 7.30 a.m., we need to wake you up with a very busy slide, okay? <laughs> um, but I, this is actually to set the tone. I don't want everybody to start reading it. Just to set the context of what we've been doing, where we want to go. I'm pretty sure you've been to quite a few UNICEF sessions so far at the summit. Um, and we're, it, this is all conversation starters. We hope to have more conversations around it. But um, to set the tone, um, as you all know, social behavior change is very central to achieving strategic goals for us. Um, and the role of private sector is critical in our partnerships work. Um, in setting the context, what we've been trying to approach and, and, and look at is in our UNICEF SBC approaches that we aim to employ more of. So beyond just co communications, community engagement, um, engaging with systems, um, working on policy reform um, and, and influencing public policy, <clears throat> as well as how we inform from a sciences approach, um, a applied behavioral and social sciences in the work that we do. What, we what we've been trying to do over the last year or so is looking at what are the intersections between the work that we would like to engage more on beyond just the communications and media perspective, working with private sector and looking at the core business that private sector actually engages in and how do we leverage that a bit more. 
So it's a conversation starter for us because we're looking at a common language, we're looking at common approaches and looking to frame what that engagement is going to look like. So um, the context for us is that there's a set of macro factors that we all know about um, that influence UNICEF development programming and humanitarian programming. But these are also driving practices in the private sector. The other issue is the language because um, also there's a different language that we use as well as that private sector uses. Um, some of the commonalities, we refer to alleviating poverty and they refer to growing human capital and local talent. So how do we find those spaces to engage better? Um, and finally, ESG is growing at an exponential pace. Um, and then there's the regulatory, the reputational, and the consumer pressures that are pushing and demanding and driving a shift from broad claims to meaningful action. So private sector is a partner. Whether we engage with them um, meaningfully is a whole other issue. So I'm going to stop there because we really want to hear from the speakers and the panel. But this was just to set the tone of the work that we're trying to do to find that alignment, that commonality, and to try to walk a little bit together. Over to you, Rajira. All right, Rania, thank you for setting the tone. Now, it's very clear that if we have any hope of hitting the SDG targets um, in 2030, we need businesses with us. And businesses recognize this, and they've made it a fair and square part of their business models. Um, at this session, we're going to be having a conversation around what companies have done to put um, human transformation at the center of their agenda and have made it an equal part of their business model and have done so very seamlessly and successfully. How do you drive profits but with purpose? How do you create a workforce that is committed, that understands the value of sustainability and work toward, works towards it actively to achieve these goals? How do you create products and services that keep sustainability at the center of what companies are trying to do? How do you build that at the community level and look at societal transformation, look at changing behaviors, look at the way in which we as humans respond to situations, stimuli, and solutions? All of these three layers combined with the layer of partnerships and working together towards these common goals is what is uh, what we're going to unpack with our very exciting panel this morning. Um, and to get us started, let me actually now introduce the panel to you. Hi, everybody. Hey, Prachi. So let me start off by introducing somebody who's in the room with us. So Hilda, do you want to just wave to everybody? Thank you so much. So Hilda joins us from Unilever, and uh, she's a senior global sustainability manager um, with Unilever, and it's a company that needs no introduction for sure. But most of her career, Hilda has worked in research and development as a behavioral scientist um, and a project leader. She has received a PhD in psychology from the University of Leuven in Belgium and joined Unilever in 1999. Um, during her career at Unilever, Hilda has contributed to and led a variety of projects, projects all aimed at gaining greater insights into consumer health, well-being, and behaviors. Hilda has also been involved in a range of academic collaborations, EU projects, and initiatives. In her current role, Hilda leads research on market-based behavior change for the Transform program, which is a unique joint initiative between Unilever, the UK's FCDO, and EY, which is aimed at helping entrepreneurs in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia improve life. Hilda, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We did have these three beautiful chairs on the stage, but I just felt it put us up there on a pedestal, and I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> I really just wanted perhaps we just sit here and have a conversation, yeah, yeah. you know, rather than sitting up there. We want to make it a level playing field symbolically as well. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, Prachi. Hi. Prachi, who's waving back at us. She's joining us from Geneva, um, and she represents the World Economic Forum at this panel today. Prachi is a marketing and communications lead at Uplink, uh, which is the open innovation platform for the World Economic Forum. She was formerly the co-founder and director of an education NGO, Life Lab Foundation. She has also worked at Ashoka University and Teach for India and holds a master's degree in development studies from the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Prachi, thank you so much for joining us and bringing in the perspective of a, an industry body and a platform that drives a lot of this work with its members. 
Rania, do you want to introduce the others? Yes, absolutely. Um, can I just ask the technical team to take the slides down so we can see everybody better? Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce Dina Sharif. Um, welcome, Dina. Uh, Dina is currently a senior lecturer at the at the Massachusetts Institute of Technical of Technology, Sloan School of Management, where she acts as the executive director of MIT Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship. <clears throat> She's also founding partner of the Cairo-based Ahead of the Curve, which is the Arab region's leading firm on issues related to sustainable business growth and impact-driven entrepreneurship. Dina is also a partner in Disrupt Tech. Egypt's first fintech focused venture capital fund as a partner, pursuing her passion in building a fund that will support technology being used as a critical tool in creating financial inclusion for a largely unbanked population, most specifically women. Dina previously held the endowed William Brown Chair for Inter International Business at the AUC in Cairo, uh, where she was also founding director of the Center for Ar Entrepreneurship. And during that time, she held the Brown Chair. Dina also taught classes on social entrepreneurship and business ethics. Prior to the above, Dina helped establish the John Gerhardt Center for Philanthropy and Civic Engagement at AUC. Dina has been a leading author of several publications. And Dina is currently a member of the Special Presidential Advisory Council for Economic Development to the President of Egypt, a global advisory board member in the Eisenhower Fellowships, and a member of the board of Kala Holding, a, a member of the board of Smart Medical Services, and a member of the board of Educate Me. She holds a master's in public administration from Harvard Kennedy School, an MA in economic development studies from AUC, and a BA in political science and international relations. Thank you so much, Dina. We're super excited to have you um, engaging with us, uh, engaging with UNICEF in this space at, for the first time. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and then it's my pleasure to also introduce Surav. Surav, can we see you and can you hear us? Okay, perfect. We had some tech issues, but he can hear us. Great. It's our pleasure to have you. This is Surav Roy. Um, he actually leads corporate social responsibility in Tata Steel. Saurav leads the corporate social responsibility efforts there, which is among the oldest, largest, and most diverse societal development efforts of India. He anchors a team of more than 600 colleagues, which works closely and constantly with communities to co-create solutions to the most underserved issues of the least vocal groups, reaching more than a million and a half lives annually across India. He joined the Tata Group as part of Tata Administrative Services in 2007, and his experience spans CSR, sustainability, and corporate finance, M and AMP, and A, across a range of sectors. So sorry, because I don't know um, private sector very well, sort of. <laughs> Um, and in this, in his last engagement, Saurav anchored the sustainability strategy work of Tata Sustainability Group and worked with Tata companies to integrate social and environmental aspects within their approaches to business. He also worked on setting up a disaster response framework for the Tata Group while managing post-disaster relief and long-term rehabilitation programs within and outside of India. He also worked with Grameen Bank in Bangladesh and other organizations in the Indian development sector before joining the Tata Group and retains a keen interest in development finance. Surf holds a graduate degree in economics from Delhi University with postgraduate diploma in management from IIM Ahmedabad and an MA in business law from Bangalore in 2015. Thank you so much, Saurav. We are so happy to have you as well. Um, so yeah, with that, I think I pass over to Ruchira and we'll get into the discussion. All right, thank you so much, Rania. We really needed to have these long introductions for our very illustrious panel because they come with a wealth of experience, um, a lot of on-ground uh, knowledge and understanding of how these issues unfold on the ground. And we're gonna unpack that um, this morning. I just also want to acknowledge the fact that Dina is joining us from New York and it's 1.30 a.m. there. So thank from you. From Boston. Dina. I really, <laughs> from Boston. Yeah. And also Saurav who joined us from India and it's the afternoon there. So we've got a panel that's truly global from all time zones. Um, and so thank you so much. We acknowledge that. I also want to let you know that online we have colleagues joining us from UNICEF um, from across the world. Um, so thank you so much for your presence with us this morning. All right, so the first um, thing that I'm going to start off with, and Hildas, you're with us in the room. I actually want to start with something that is at the heart and center of all businesses, which is its workforce. You know, people make um, the place and they make the work environment and the culture. 
and creating a work ethos where purpose drives the business strategy um, and all employees and the entire work environment is geared towards contributing to this and living this vision of sustainability is really heart of the U is at the heart of uh, Unilever's business model. So my question to you is, how do organizations like UNICEF, uh, like Unilever, drive this internally, and what is the role um, a dedicated and committed workforce plays in delivering on the sustainability agenda? Great, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming this morning. I know it's it's fairly early and it was a very busy night. Um, um, and um, yeah, I'd like to congratulate Morocco really because um, they did beat Belgium. I'm originally from Belgium in the group stages. It makes me feel better that they're going through now. So so it kind of validates that that win. Um, so so I'm from um, Unilever. For those of you who don't um, know Unilever, so Unilever is a global company. Um, and um, basically it it produces um, foods, uh, personal care products, home care products. Um, you you probably know some of our brands, at least some of our brands, Domestus, Live Boy, um, Walls, um, Magnum, uh, Nor, uh, a range a range um, of of products um, really. Now, um, Unilever is um, a very large company. Um, about 150,000 uh, people work um, for Unilever, and we oper operate in over 190 countries. Um, now, Unilever was um, uh, founded quite a while ago, um, and it was founded, founded by Will William um, Lever, um, who um, produced the, the sunlight soap. And um, he was quite big on purpose, actually. Um, and I always kind of like one of the, the things he wanted to achieve was to lessen work for women. I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but but it, it shows his, his commitment um, to purpose. The, the current purpose for um, Unilever is um, to make sustainable living commonplace and really that is um, behind kind of what drives the entire company so um, as Unilever we want to be a global um, leader in um, sustainable business we don't have a separate um, CSR um, um, group um, because we feel that CSR as such needs to be embedded in to the entire um, business strategy so it's just our business strategy um, we not just we we want we want to um, of course do do um, well as a company, but by doing good and doing good for um, people and society. That is um, the way we that is um, um, expressed is in what is our compass strategy. Now that compass strategy has, has five broad points about um, how we will do well um, as a business, um, and it's about um, where we want to grow, uh, what channels we want to use. But the one I want um, to draw your attention to is the third um, um, point in that. Compass strategies, we will win with, with brands as a force for good, powered by purpose and innovation. So it's about um, having um, functionally superior products that, that will delight our consumers, but we also want to take action on um, social and environmental issues. Um, and underneath that, um, that point, um, there are kind of broad headings. We want to improve um, the health of the planet. We want to improve health and well-being of the people um, um, we serve. And then um, finally, we want to contribute to a, a fairer um, and more socially inclusive world. And, and again, um, there are subheadings with specific targets about um, what, what we want to do there. So... It's, I would say it's, it's ingrained um, in our uh, company and in our business um, strategy. Um, and we have um, evidence that of the brands, our brands that have a strong, strong purpose are actually the brands that are performing um, really well. So, so, so they consistently um, um, deliver better results um, financially um, than, than some of the uh, other brands. So, so that's the, I think the first point is it's all about the, the business strategy and everyone is behind this business strategy from the, it goes down from, from the top. And the second point then um, to make is um, when it comes to people working for for um, Unilever, we all kind of work on our purpose. So we all do um, kind of purpose workshops where we 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 
think and and why are we here behind beyond kind of okay we all want a job and we all need to earn money but how can how do we want to make that um contribution um so we all kind of um think about it and and verbalize that and then i think the third point um i'd like to make to answer your question is all around accountability um so there are specific targets for the things we we want um to achieve um that is tracked um and and um, there is transparency of, about um those those targets and how we do it against those targets just just to hold ourselves as people and as a company accountable that's very very interesting so somebody who joins unilever from day one uh, understands this and becomes a part of this ethos and this work environment um that the organization sort of that's the dna of the organization as as much as i understand you know so it, it it is in the dna of the organization and also you do tend to attract a certain type of people um i mean that a lot of um young people and older people do want to make a difference um and and um and join a company where they they will feel that that they can do that so so it's it's in that respect once you once you get that reputation you also tend to attract a certain type of of uh, people wanting to work for that company you know i can i have a very uh, short personal story to stay to share on um, you know how purpose becomes a very important driver my son who's six now my husband works with the private sector and obviously the kids would visit both our offices and one day the six-year-old tells my husband dad i know you have the bigger office but you know mom has a much more meaningful job so a six-year-old understood the purpose that you know unicef works towards and he could get it and he understood it and he clearly could you know sort of articulate that so just to say that even from a very young age the value of contributing back to society is something that really you know gives you a big purpose right Rania. and i'm going to pick up from there so um we're going to go to sorov next because really building on um reach and impact sort of um the name tata and I, I also worked in india for more than four years so there was nowhere we could go where you did not hear tata's contributions within indian society actually so the name tata is syn synonymous with responsible business and social impact um you've been in tata in various capacities as we mentioned when we were when we were introducing you we want to hear more from you about how the organization has managed to create an ethos and work culture that's built around sustainability and creating a positive impact. So could you talk to us about that? Over to you, Saurav. Sure. So uh, I, 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 ho I hope my voice is coming through just to do a tech check. Loud and clear. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, a big hello to everyone in the room and uh, you know, good Good morning, good night, good evening, depending on where who is. Um, no, just uh, I wanted to pick up from where uh, I think my previous co-panelists left off. Uh, so when this question on purpose, actually, I, I, uh, I'd just like to make it a little more personal. I think the way it starts is why have I been with the Tatas for, the 50, for 15 years now? You know, that's, that's where the question actually starts from. Uh, so I'm just going to share a few things that I have experienced uh, through and through and uh, with the Tatas. So the first thing is, uh, you know, there's a certain genetic code to the business. The point is, I mean, responsibility, et cetera, does not come from, you know, an ask from investors and ask for any external stakeholders. It sort of comes from within. So I think for us, uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, since we're talking of uh, colleagues within the business, you know, since we're talking of the workforce, uh, a lot of the most of the uh, the worker laws, the labor laws of the country okay, uh, were actually uh, internal company policies. I mean, graduate, maternity leave. Uh, now we've, uh, we have a, uh, you know, LGBTQ policy. Uh, a lot of these policies were actually internal data policies and they were adopted in the process of constitution making for the country and then they became laws as they went by. So that's the starting point and our, uh, We've had uh, our founder uh, set out a very interesting code, a very crystal clear code saying that the community is not just another stakeholder, it is a center of any enterprise. You know? And then the other belief that we've, been, we've seen play out very interestingly is the fact that uh, you know, even the returns of business, even if they're profits, they're, that's essentially money that is being held in trusteeship you know, for communities. And that's the, it's not just, you know, the conversation on purpose doesn't start after profits. The conversation on purpose starts before profits. 
you know, in the process of making profits. So this is the code that we've seen go through. I think some some things that have worked really uh, that uh, work really well for us is uh, you know one. Uh, so we have a we have a policy saying that uh, that uh, uh, and and it is true that I think eventually this genetic code it starts from the top. It starts from how decisions are made, how decisions are made. The question that we asked ourselves is, you know, how how does that genetic code remain intact at the top? You know, what are the kind of experiences, sensory and otherwise, we're creating uh, to make sure that happens? So we actually have a, uh, you know, sort of code within uh, most of our large companies, which uh, which has a which has an unwritten rule saying that there is an immersion program, a community immersion program, which is designed to spark sensitivity, spark uh, spark an understanding that there are people who are going to be left behind, and how do we be conscious of you know. Uh, people in circumstances that are not as fortunate as let's say who we are and unless you've done that immersion you actually don't qualify for a leadership role in these companies you know, so the point is how do you take purpose and hard code it uh, within your system so that that uh, you know seems to be working the other thing that works really is to create spaces within our companies where difficult conversations happen right? so even now when a lot of us are running after technology a lot of us are running after you know automation different uh, you know uh, Business 4.0 or whatever you call it, there's actually a very active conversation and and uh, experimentation that's going on within the group on what that really means for employment opportunities, what that means for you know redefinition of merit. So it's not just left to chance. There's actually a parallel conversation that happens. You know, so 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 the consequence of this is that uh, more than purpose amongst our workforce, there is an ask for purpose. The first checkpoint, if a Tata company is deviating from purpose, comes from its workforce. You know, and then says that, hey, I mean, they're the first voices coming, you know, this is not what a Tata company is supposed to do. So it's not often, you know, while the leadership sets direction, the ask for purpose, the demand for purpose comes from all over the company. So that all, all over, you know, all across the workforce. So that's one. Uh, you know, and then, then sort of we take it into, I think we were mentioning product design, we were mentioning process design, I think introduction of carbon prices, we are actively looking at creation of, you know, looking at maybe a, a price around social capital, you know, how do you look at the social impact of, uh, you know, any capital investment projects, product designs and sort of try and codify, it. how do you tap into our know-how and then, uh, you know, and this whole thing about uh, the development narrative or a social narrative or an ecological narrative coming back to business you know, and being embedded in business, that's, that's one school of thought. Particularly in India, you know, uh, there may be circumstances where that may be limiting to solving the larger problem. You know, so we, uh, we have a program which works with about 1.6 million children right now on access, governance, uh, learning outcomes all across. And that I personally find it very difficult to loop it back to a business model or a business rationale to do it. It's just the right thing to do, you know, and one has to run after the right thing to do. And then, you know, if you feel strongly about it and then find ways to loop it back into the business. So these two narratives, there's a conscious understanding that these two narratives have to run in parallel. If everything loops back into the business might be a li little limiting to purpose. So I don't know if that's controversial, but I just want to put that out there. And I think that's what really works for us. So that's what I had with you. Thank you so Run. much, Sora. Um, there's so many nuggets in there, and I, I don't know where even to begin, but I, I really love how you started with um, the leadership of, of how you in, your own internal policies influenced and in, uh, the engagement with public policy and changes in public policy. And I think that that is very important to really highlight. Mm -hmm. And also what you were talking about in terms of purpose and how pur purpose is driven from within and how it is focused on the workforce in order for business to be able to succeed. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure that we'll be reflecting a lot more on that. And I will pass it back to Ruchira for our next panelist. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Rania. So it's becoming fairly clear that organizations who are doing well, businesses who are doing well uh, profitably um, are doing it with a sense of purpose and are doing it with a workforce that is equally committed and driven by the sense of purpose. And that's a very, very important takeaway in terms of changing behaviors of humans, people who are part of, uh, you know, creating work environment. But I want to go to Prachi now. Prachi, you represent the World Economic Forum and the role that the forum plays in really triggering behavior change and talking about sustainability and purpose with the larger business fraternity, the opportunities that you create for businesses to understand this, to change themselves 
and then get that to trickle down to communities is very well established. You're the, you're the lead in that. But my question to you is, you know, can you share a little bit about what does it take at WEF to really play this effective part, to really play this role of being a change maker? Thanks, Ruchira. Such a pleasure to be here. And hi, hello to everybody in the room. Um, so like you were, you were saying earlier is that some businesses, of course, like Tata and Unilever have embedded this idea of social impact into their very fabric, uh, while some are just kind of waking up to, to, to this. So I think the forum plays a really critical role in that um, for some of you. Who already know some of you don't uh forum the world economic forum is the international organization for public private cooperation and it engages various stakeholders so it engages political leaders business leaders and other key stakeholders to shape global regional and industry agendas industry of course is a very important part of this model and i think Rishira, you were saying earlier that any long lasting sustainable change will require the cooperation and collaboration of the industry so i think uh, the forum really kind of uses its convening power, its neutrality, and uh, the fact that it has built this credible platform. Um, and it brings all of these people together and spotlights the most important challenges that are facing our planet. Uh, so I think it's, its real power really lies in bringing all of these different stakeholders from different parts of society at the same table and give them a common language. Um, to talk about some of these problems. So just to share a little bit, I mean, I'm sure all of you know about the forum's annual meeting at Davos. Uh, it's supposed to be a really high profile event and there's always uh, you know, a lot of speculation around who's attending, what's happening. So this year, for example, um, the, the theme of the annual meeting is cooperation in a fragmented world. And the program will really spotlight really pressing issues for our society today, like the energy and the food crisis. Uh, the current geopolitical risks, uh, social vulnerabilities in the context of, you know, work, skills, care. And, and so by bringing these issues to the fore, uh, I think the forum really drives dialogue around how can we build new systems of energy, climate, work, society, care, all of these types of things. So I think, again, going back to the convening power of the forum, bringing all these diverse players to the same table uh, to discuss some of these issues. And Perhaps, I don't know, I can share, I don't know, Richard, if I have the time, but I can share maybe one more example um, of, of a forum project that has done that. Go right ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so another really good example is um, that of the Alliance of Clean Air, which was launched by the forum and the Clean Air Fund at COP26 in 2021, I think. Uh, this is an influential group of 16 business leaders who have committed to measuring and reducing uh, the air pollution, which is caused by their organizations and, um, you know, the operations and their value chains. So this group is also driving innovation and encouraging their partners as well uh, to cut air pollution. So since its launch, the alliance has now grown um, and, and, and has all these businesses on board like Accenture, EY, Google, GlaxoKleinSmith, Mahindra, Oracle. Um, so this really, again, kind of demonstrates the role that the forum plays in bringing all of these different parties together and enabling a conversation and dialogue around how we can collectively uh, change our actions to drive positive social change. Thank you so much for those examples, Prachi. And you know, the one thing that I'm picking up from all the three speakers that we've heard from this morning is the opportunity to have difficult conversations, whether that's at the workplace, uh, sort of talked about the opportunity to discuss, um, you know, uh, critical issues, uh, the opportunity to come together and dialogue um, and to build a common sense of purpose. It's driven individually, but opportunities to really collaborate, to engage, to discuss and come together seems to be the underlying theme of creating that sense of purpose and enabling change. Right, Rania? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And so thank you so much, Prachi. Um, yeah, that was very, very interesting particularly on the issues that you choose to spotlight as well and how you work together and collaborate together um, for a common goal on that. So we're going to shift gears just a little bit at going to Dina um, to hear a little bit more about social entrepreneurship and your perspective on that, because I think that that's a very, that's a, a very important driving force. 
Um, Dina, building on your experience, you've been an advocate and an avid facilitator that social entrepreneurship is a significant pathway to addressing and even solving some of the most pressing sustainable development challenges. Could you share your perspective particularly on how UNICEF can more effectively engage with entrepreneurs, specifically in emerging markets, and also explain a little bit about emerging markets and how we define them. Over to you. Thank you, Rania, and uh, thank, thank you for inviting me. And I apologize if uh, at any point I'm not coherent since it is a little past 2 a.m. my time. Um, so I think you know, over over the years, I've actually dropped the word social from social entrepreneurship uh, because I've I've found that it's it it is something that has become quite controversial in the sense that we believe there has to be a conditionality. Um, you either create social change and give up profits, or you give up profits and and compromise social change. And the the reality is, I don't think that that there is a need for that conditionality. I think entrepreneurship at its very essence exists to solve. When I say entrepreneurship, I don't mean SMEs. I mean innovation-driven entrepreneurship uh, where we apply a market-driven, create market-driven solutions to very complex issues. And that means that we're actually um, solving a problem. Uh, and I think for if we think of it in that in that framing, uh, profit and social change should come hand in hand. So if we're actually meeting a need, we should be generating profits and we should be creating change at the same time. Um, I think when uh, uh, I run a center called the Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship, and this center at MIT focuses on what ha they have historically called emerging markets, and. Uh, I now refer to these emerging markets as growth markets. So when we think about it, um, the greater majority of the world's population exists within, uh, outside of what we call the developed markets um, or emerging markets. I can so I call these now growth markets because the uh, majority of GDP growth is happening within these markets today. So what we're seeing is we're seeing economic growth um, over, over the past decade, we've been seeing exponential um, exponential growth in those GDP rates uh, in, in countries in Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia and the Middle East, where, where I come from. Now, entrepreneurs are a big driving force behind that growth. I think that UNICEF, I think UNICEF has done an amazing job at engaging uh, companies like Unilever and Tata and some of the bigger um, multinationals and big corporates that exist. I think UNICEF can do a much better job at engaging bottom, bottom up the entrepreneurs who are coming up with innovative solutions to problems related to climate, to water and sanitation, um, to clean clean energy, to education. Uh, ed tech is booming. Healthcare innovation is booming. Health tech is booming. Um, and I think what we sometimes, I and, you know, we see this everywhere in the world, we sometimes ignore those at the very beginning of their journey. And I think what UNICEF can do is to really think about ways to even before we get to entrepreneurs who have actually started a business, there's a lot that can be done to raise awareness around um, the, the issues that UNICEF deals with. And I think raising awareness of the actual problems or challenges on the ground can actually create a space for young people to see these problems as opportunities and to actually come up with solutions to solve some of those challenges. I think, uh, so that's number one, I think awareness and creating better awareness around the complex issues on the ground. Uh, number two, partner partnering with these entrepreneurs. I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs um, who would who would be very eager to partner with a with an agency like UNICEF because your reach is wide and vast and it's global, uh, and I think you're actually close to to what is happening on the ground, which gives them a, a much better much better access to actually working closer to people and communities. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of conversations, and I know that there I know that UNDP, for example, um, have actually. Uh, done some work around investing in entrepreneurs. I think I think providing capital or access to capital to entrepreneurs who are solving challenges that are very much related to the UNICEF mission is something to think about. Um, I also think that 
uh, because of the wide reach of UNICEF globally, there's a lot that UNICEF can do to work with entrepreneurs to help them scale their solutions across markets. Now, when we think about growth markets or emerging markets, it's it's actually not easy for an Egyptian entrepreneur, um, so for where I come from or where Aranya comes from, to, to scale their solution to India, for example, or to scale their solution to Nigeria. I think uh, an agency like UNICEF can actually go a long way in helping these entrepreneurs think about how they can scale their solutions uh, across borders. Um, and then I think lastly, I think, uh, you know, UNICEF, your main counterpart is actually the government and you have a lot of influence on policymakers. I think working with policymakers to actually provide greater incentives to those entrepreneurs who are actually solving complex challenges using technology and innovation to do that, um, or those who we would consider impact-driven entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs, there's a lot that governments can do to provide them with incentives that would help them grow and scale. And I think UNICEF can, can definitely have an impact on the way policymakers see these entrepreneurs and how they can provide different kinds of tax incentives to help them grow over time. I think I'll stop there and, and let, you, uh, let you all move to the, the next question. Sorry, mic issues. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dina. Um, that was that was brilliant. Um, I think really taking away from what you just um, left off on, there's been a lot of discussion, particularly on climate justice and social justice here. So your points very much speak to um, what we've been deliberating on, and and the point around creating um, a, a better public policy environment, uh, and what UNICEF's role, as well as other partners within the space of SBC, particularly on incentivizing entrepreneurs, as well as other partners that are at local level um, to address some of these pressing social issues is so important for us to delve into. So um, we are, I, I, we're gonna shift and thank you so much for that because I think that there's so much richness in what everybody has already said. Um, we have about 10 minutes for the session. So we wanna do just another proper, proper rapid fire la last set of questions. And then we're going to take some questions from um, the audience. So over to you, Ruchira. Thank you, Rania. Um, you raised a very, very important point, Rina, and thank you for that, because the one thing that I do want to highlight is that the way that we even, you know, behavior change begins at home. So even as UNICEF, you know, the one thing that we've changed is what constitutes business for us. So for us at UNICEF, when we talk about businesses, we are not talking only about the big companies. We're not talking about the multinationals. In our official definition of business, we talk about SMEs, we talk about the informal sector, the ones who are not even a part of the formal um, economy. We talk about uh, platforms, think tanks, industry bodies. We talk about academia, um, foundations. It's a very broad definition and a broad term that UNICEF uses um, when we say business sector. And that's why we sort of differentiate also between the private sector uh, and the business sector. So, you know, change begins at home, Rania. Um, but building on the point about innovations and social entrepreneurs, I want to go back to Prachi very, very quickly, um, because Prachi, you know, you also represent the Uplink project. And do you want to share very quickly what Uplink does and uh, how that's also promoting social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, not just social entrepreneurship um, and innovations, really? Yeah, I would love to. So uh, to Dana's point where, you know, social entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs find it challenging to scale their solutions, to, to have financial incentives and things like that. That is the reason that Uplink exists. Uh, it is the open innovation platform of the World Economic Forum and a global innovation ecosystem. To put it very simply, Uplink builds bridges between entrepreneurs and the investors, experts, businesses, partners who can help them scale their venture and accelerate impact for society. Uh, and I just want to share really quickly also that Uplink's tagline is business unusual. So we really stand for innovation and experimentation that challenges the modus operandi of, of traditional businesses. Thank you so much, Prachi. So from purpose, from a workforce to looking at entrepreneurship as a model and how that's being promoted, I want to shift gears now completely and talk about something that's at the heart of every business, which is its product 
products and services. So Unilever, of course, has done so much work around messaging um, and shaping behaviors seamlessly through marketing and consumer interface um, on issues such as gender, uh, gender roles, hand washing, um, water usage, environment, child rights, and among, amongst others. You've done that beautifully through your products and you know, uh, the way you market them. But how have you used sustainability as the driving factor in researching and developing products, uh, but also engaging with consumers and changing behaviors and social norms um, and practices that really contribute to sustainability and societal transformation? Right, that's that's a big question, but uh, um, I'll, I'll I'll try to take a bite out of it. Um, so we are a consumer goods company. Um, so we make products that will hopefully de delight our consumers. So everything we do is um, user centered, consumer focused. Um, we really need to know our com um, um, consumers very well. So um, 3.4 billion people use our products every day. Um, so our reach is 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 quite um, large, as you can imagine. Um, and um, our product development teams, our innovation teams work very hard to um, make these products as best um, as, as they can be. So, so um, really kind of functionally superior products um, that, that uh, washing powders that, that wash better than, than, than before or um, foods with a high nutritional value, um, products that have less environmental impact. So, one of the issues for us is that um, it's not just about the product itself. Uh, it's very much also about how you use that product. As you know, you, you can have a, a perfect soap if you don't know when you need to use, uh, when you need to wash your hands or how long you need to wash your hands for, it's no use. Um, so uh, that's why our focus has always very much been on um, the combination of the product and the use and the behavior change that is um, required. Now. I assume there are quite a few people here in the room with a background in kind of psychology, behavior change, et cetera. And you know that there are various theories frameworks, strategies, um, and, and I think you can sometimes get a bit lost um, in all of that. So um, I th what our um, R&D team um, has done is um, condensed that um, all these theories in a workable framework that can be used really throughout the company by our marketeers who may not be experts in um, psychology. And it's called the five levers of um, uh, five levers for change. Um, and it, it it talks about um, how you need to understand um, your target group, the barriers, the triggers, the motivators, which is things that probably aren't um, um, which are probably all all um, known to to you, and then um, gives you the kind of five levers for change um, that that you can use um, to encourage the correct use of, of the products. It's um, make it understood, easy, desirable, rewarding a habit. And I think um, the, the, the strength of our kind of behavior change program has been the consistent use of that framework, be it for um, Life Boy, for example, with the, the schools program and the schools of, of five, where it's been encouraging um, um, hand washing in children, uh, Working with partners, for example, like um, UNICEF or um, um, getting uh, children to, to brush their teeth. It's exactly the same framework um, and, it's, and you don't need expert psychologists um, to use it. And then um, another point to make um, also is that um, we have the power of the brand um, and brand loyalty um, and um, the brand consistency um, as well, uh, which has really helped. Um, I think the, the the basic kind of message behind what Live Boy does hasn't hasn't really um, changed. And as you all know, for behavior change, that's what you need. You need kind of to keep going at it and and that consistency. So for Unilever um, as a consumer goods, goods company behavior change is, is crucial um, and it will be in the future as well. We, we have so many kind of new challenges um, to do with um, climate change. And, and, and again, that will require systemic change clearly, but uh, as an element of that, there will be um, uh, people, yeah, behavior change involved as well. 
I think it's been extremely interesting to see the shift uh, in the way products are marketed and sold and the way, you know, some of them have been uh, rechristened. For example, Dove being called the real beauty bar and triggering conversations around the concepts of beauty or what constitutes beauty of women of women's self-image has been so empowering, you know, especially young girls or the work um, around the way laundry detergents are traditionally sold and targeted only at women. You know, laundry being a shared load or the right to play for children and, you know, uh, it's okay for clothes. So some of those things, things that we don't even realize as consumers are so subtly weaved into the way your products are designed, developed, um, and then put out there in the market. I guess that 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 comes back to the the, the purpose-led uh, brands. So for, for Dove, for example, Dove is all about um, body confidence and, and self-esteem. And, and you see that weaved um, throughout them. Um, <laughs> the mic keeps playing games with me. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Hilda. And I, I'm going to shift to Sarah and, and go back to him just because, you know, with the stream of the discussion that we've been happening, having, um, I want we would like to hear a little bit more from you also about, from your perspective and all the work that Tata has done um, and the multiple different facets that Tata works on, um, what are the untapped opportunities Um that you're going to focus on or you've identified and you want to work a bit more on to achieve social and behavior change as a specific, with specific outcomes. So what specific sectors of the growth market are, in your perspective, are particularly relevant? Over to you, Saurabh. So do I have the whole day to answer that or? No, I mean... you only have two minutes, <laughs> unfortunately. But yes, just to get our minds going, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> no, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back and start uh, with, 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 that point on, with that point on conversations that we were talking about, you know, what kind of conversations happen within, uh, within companies, uh, within our company, outside with communities. Uh, you know, the first first big mental shift, uh, and, and I say that because I think that's a huge opportunity that, you know, I see, you know, it, it's, it's, it takes some doing, and it's an opportunity that we shouldn't let go of, is, is to make sure that, uh, you know, as far as products, processes, etc. are concerned, the conversations are, in, are, are diverse or plural within the companies right from the word go. You know, so you don't have just technologies or communicators, uh, you know, working on brand communications, only technologists working on tech developments. So, you know, there is a space for sociologists, ecologists, uh, and, and uh, you know, thinking with communities, uh, not just from a focus group approach or not just from a, you know, when the need arises, but thinking with communities as a, uh, you know, as just the thing to do, as just the right thing to do. Is is something that has uh, you know reaped huge dividends for us. Uh, we we've now gone into uh, we, we are the first company to look at steel as a service. You know uh, where uh, we 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 probably have the largest portfolio of brands in Dara Steel amongst the country. One of the largest portfolios of brands, but we are at the end of the day a steel company. That mental shift. Uh, uh, today places us very well to look at many opportunities, which eventually will have, uh, you know, social outcomes. We went into doors. We have a line of doors called Pravesh. We have, uh, um, you know, low cost prefabricated housing, you know, where the, you know, the interiors of the housing don't feel like steel. And this, these happened about eight or 10 years ago. But the reason I'm bringing this up is all of this came out of conversations with communities. The door story is very interesting because when the team, when we started speaking to communities, uh, most of the houses, temporary or otherwise, the feedback or the conversation that we have in the community is we don't like, uh, you know, we don't like bending too much to get into our own house. You know, that's not a very dignified way of anyone coming into our own house. So can we have low cost doors? And, you know, those product ideas come from uh, there. Uh, in terms of opportunities, see, from, from, a, uh, from a partnerships, SBC opportunity, uh, I'll, I'll just begin a little from outside on the peripheries of the business first. I think there are massive challenges in India. If you look at, uh, you know, if you look at the adolescent narrative, if you, uh, you know, if you look at the education narrative, uh, which, which need a lot of thinking right now, 
and the opportunity to me is there's a lot of solutioning is happening but the problem is not getting solved and that's going to be the challenge over the next two or three uh, i don't know maybe four or five years uh, to me the stickiest part of the community is uh, is not going to be addressed through digital solutions or platforms and that's where if we can forge collaborations alliances partnerships which you know lend each other staying power or the patience if you know if, uh, i mean uh, a lot of capital now tends to be a little impatient but the stickiest problems are not solved by impatient capital you need patient capital i think if there are partnerships that are forged alliances that come together which you know the partners give each other the kind of staying power uh to to last the course of a problem which earlier took 10 years to solve would even now take 7 or 8 years to solve it's not going to be solved in one one and a half years you know and and uh, it's not there's no magic pill on sbc that suddenly come across which says that you know communities uh, we still need to behavior change still is very complex but uh, yeah i mean that that that's what i would i think in terms of opportunities now how do we tap into this i again as i said i think some part of it is of course there are there will there is a huge i mean trillion dollar business opportunity in sort of making this happen uh but i am a big proponent of uh, you know while we look at the business case we actually look at the problem in its entirety first and understand the opportunity and then sort of see some 90% of that could be a business I think I think sort of froze. Okay, so um, just because well, just, that's too much the biggest opportunity. Oh. Thank you, sort of. Sorry, we missed the last few seconds, but I think we got the gist of what you were trying to say. Um, I mean, I think what you mentioned around. Um, you know it's more than just products and services as you were saying and there's a need for the long term vision and commitment and it and you well articulated that business um recognizes that and wants to be a partner for that and that it's not it's it's a long journey and we need to be on that journey together um complex problems have complex solutions and and figuring that out we need to work together so you know on on that um that's actually a good segue and shift to coming back to Dina as well for the last um uh intervention from you Dina and then we'll open it up but if you can build on um what you were mentioning in terms of the commitment um uh, that entrepreneurs already have to social issues so not calling it social entrepreneurship because what they are doing is already that contribution but there are lots of spaces within the business sector that we also don't engage with um you mentioned for example supporting entrepreneurs whether financially or non-financially and and partnering with them but would you talk a little bit more about um the growing risk capital space um and and how how could we possibly unicef or others that work in the sbc space um better align and understand those company portfolios and and with the mission that we have which is towards sustainable development progress and think at the social change level how do we work better together so over to you dina yeah thank you rania and i think um surav kind of uh i think uh he mentioned a little bit he talked a little bit about patient capital uh when it comes to solving complex issues and I've become really obsessed with this venture capital risk capitals when we think about risk capital it's everything from angel investing to venture capital um idea early stage investing to series A series B and I I I have this firm belief that the beginning of every journey really matters and when it, when an innovation driven entrepreneur comes to raise capital they go to venture capitalists and I think if when we're thinking let's think a little bit about unicef almost every system touches the life of a child every system from healthcare to education to transportation to energy you have all these complex systems uh that are to a great extent and nothing revealed this more than the pandemic broken and then you have all these amazing young entrepreneurs who are using technology and uh R&D to solve some of these complex challenges now 
to a great extent, the venture capital space, they're still very focused on the, the Silicon Valley playbook. How do we invest? How do we get our money out within a certain period of time? And that's the kind of core focus. And that's very much driven by the LPs in these funds, so the limited partners. So you have fund managers, and then you have those who give the fund managers money, and there, there are layers, right? And I think we need to see um, organizations like UNICEF engage those who are investing in these funds and engage fund managers in a much more strategic manner. Because when we think about, so I'm a partner in a venture capital fund, right? right? But when you think about you say you have a hundred million dollar fund or a fifty million dollar fund, and you need to deploy that capital across, you know, 20, 30 entrepreneurs. That is enormous power to actually transform a system. And when my fund, when we made a strategic decision to only focus on fintech, it was because we wanted to transform the financial inclusion space using technology. And in that sense, when we think about how we invest our money in different companies, we're investing in building a portfolio that will lead to systems transformation. Now, most, a lot of funds don't think that way. And I think UNICEF can do a lot and um, others like UNICEF can do a lot to educate limited partners and educate fund managers on, on the incredible significance of capital and how capital is allocated and how capital also needs to be an activist for social justice and social change uh, through how they invest their money and build out their portfolios to allow for systems transformation that really works for everybody and that will touch the lives of children and make their lives better. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, yes, absolutely. I think, yeah, I walk away with that, those words in my mind, the significance of activating capital for social justice, because I think that is really what does convene many of, you know, our purpose-led work and all of the organizations that we actually work with, but just hearing that from that space of business um, and, and, and how we need to possibly think about how do we do better to really engage in those strategic discussions? Because uh, I think that that's a level uh, at the social change level that we really need to engage and delve into a little bit more. So we are at time, but we did start a little bit late. So we have about what, I think 10, five, five minutes actually. Oh, oh you, uh, Ruchira decided that we have 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so we are going to take a couple of questions. I see two hands already up, three hands. Oh, wow, a lot. All right, let me, shall I start on the left first, just to be different? <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I really want to compliment this fantastic panel. Um, and I especially want to compliment Dina. I really agreed with pretty much everything you've said. My question though is um, directed to companies that have shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so if this was a, I mean, we're in a room where we all pretty much agree that child protection and child rights and health are, are the right things to do. Um, but if we were in a room full of shareholders at, at Unilever or another company that had shareholders, um, what would you say to them? Because shareholders are expecting a return that's at least as good as they would find investing in another company. They're, they're motivated by the profit and the return. And if they don't get the return, they'll go somewhere else. So what would you say to them about investing in, in, in uh, the workforce, of course, in purpose-driven workforce, but for us, for the larger context in SBC? So do we let, uh, can I let um, Hilda answer that one? And then maybe Saurabh, do you want to come in and uh, answer that and the, to the same question? Yes, if it's the same question, please do add. Question um, that does relate to profit and the conflict between profit and public policy. And the question that I have is for Unilever um, is how one markets the foods for babies and how does that fit with UNICEF policies? Uh, hold on a second. Um, and and the influence that you Uni that Unilever or other baby food companies have over public policy and governments 
Um, and I've noticed in, in many countries that there isn't a support for um, the, the extensive breastfeeding policies that are needed. And it links very much to the, 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 the question about profit. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so maybe I'm going to let uh, Saurav and Hilda respond to that, and we'll go to a question online, which Carlotta has there. So we'll toggle. Right. Um, I will try to answer that to the extent that I can. So I, I mean, I work in R and D, so so I'm 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 not in external relations here. Um, I th I think on on the shareholder point, um, I think there is a recognition um, that making profit and, and, and doing good aren't mutually exclusive. And I think one of the proof points for us is that th the brands with purpose, they, they deliver consistently better results, also financial results. So, so I think that you, you can, you can um, have, have both, but, but you're right. We, we, we are a commercial company and we need to make profit and, but, but it's, um, we've, we've proven so far that they're not mutually exclusive. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure I can answer your, your point on the, the baby foods. We, as far as I know, we don't, I mean, we, we don't, um, 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 sell baby foods, but I may be wrong. So I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I just can't, can't answer that. Thank you so much. Saurav, uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, what was just shared in terms of profits and value um, to consumers, to shareholders, to everybody? Do we have Saurav online? Or we, we may have uh, lost him. Anybody else wants to reflect on that or share thoughts? Not a question, but add. Dina, did you want to add something? I saw you unmute. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think... Um... I, I think of shareholders in the same way I think of limited partners and funds. You know, the the when we think of shareholders, d historically and and traditionally, I think we've always seen they've always seen themselves of investing money. We need a return on our investment, and there are certain terms of how that looks. And nobody has ever really provided. Um, a broader context of how profit should be generated. And I think, you know, when that famous sentence of uh, the, the only uh, purpose of business is to generate uh, profit um, was taken out of context because uh, it was the only business of business is to generate profit. But in reality, um, business also has to comply by with regulations and whatever governments tell them to do. So in the absence of regulations that ensure that business behaves in a way that will allow for sustainable and inclusive prosperity that doesn't do harm, and that puts the citizen at the very center and the user at the very center, then sure, everyone is going to be after generating and making profits. So I think we we can't divorce business, shareholders, limited partners, fund managers, that entire space of capital can't be divorced from the broader regulatory environment and the, and the role that the regulatory environment has on ensuring that society stays healthy and protected. Um, and I know that we've put a lot of focus on um, business and how profit is evil and how the private sector behaves poorly. And yes, that's true. That is a narrative. But I think we also haven't focused enough on the fact that governments and government regulations really haven't provided the, the right framework for businesses to behave in a way that puts society at the very center. And that doesn't mean that profits will be compromised. Uh, it may mean that your profits, you won't get as much profits in a short period of time. It may mean that your profits will come back over a longer period of time. It may mean that instead of making several multiple billions, you'll be making slightly less billion. You know, I don't know what it would mean because we don't really live in a world where that is the case. And I think that's something we need to explore. Thank you so much. You wanted to build on that. Yes, please. Um, I, want to test I, I want to bring the testimony. I a former uh, Unilever employee, and I can say that Unilever commitment to sustainability and commitment uh, and common good is really a driver 
to join the company and to uh, increase the uh, commitment of the employees. And building on the uh, prof profit and social change, I had the uh, opportunity to champion the uh, platform for the uh, Omo brand, the uh, hand washing and uh, machine washing uh, uh, brand, uh, which was Dirt is Good. And uh, it was clearly uh, completely, we were looking at changing the norms because uh, one of the strong norms in our countries is that uh, dirt is bad and uh, clean is good. It's uh, linked to our faith, etc. So we were with, it, with this platform also encouraging parents to uh, give the freedom to their kids to play and experience, which means that this will, be, will bring uh, a bit of, uh, a lot of dirt. And I can uh, testify that we drove the market shares of the brand really, uh, we, we had a very uh, uh, significant increase in the market shares. So this is an example where you can drive the profits along with the social change that's a very good point. And I often, you know, when we do our sessions, even in-house for UNICEF colleagues, we start with saying, you know, uh, there's a popular notion that profit is bad, as if profit is dirty, as if profit is not good. What we forget is in a lot of the development context around the world, profit is what drives economies. We need employment. We need, uh, you know, there to be money in the economy to generate, uh, you know, that, uh, that capital that you need to, for people to access systems, access things for them, you know, to improve their livelihood. We're talking about, uh, you know, people having a basic standard of living. So sometimes, you know, that's a balance that you need to keep when talking about uh, concepts of profit and purpose, clearly. But I want to go to Carlotta, who's had her hand up for a very long time um, and take a question from online. Actually, can you hear me? Very clearly, Carlotta. Yes. Uh, I don't have a question because looking at the time, I thought uh, this was going to be the towards the end of the session. And unfortunately, I have to leave uh, because I myself going to a school event to see my sister, my daughter participating to this live museum on activists for social change. So same subject matter, but applied to the work that my daughter is doing. But I wanted just to, to take the opportunity maybe uh, you know, like to highlight two, three points uh, uh, from what came up, uh, you know, like in this very rich discussion so far. And three points uh, and concepts that uh, really resonate not only with UNICEF, uh, but with the work that UNICEF uh, is doing uh, with uh, and on the private sector and business in particular. So the first is this concept of purpose and purpose be beyond the ethos dimension. Uh, around uh, business and beyond uh, the compliance uh, aspects and let alone beyond the reputational um, imperative. And I think uh, the panelists today uh, really demonstrate how social transformation and purpose can be and is a propeller for business to succeed. And uh, how there is now much evidence about that. Unilever was bringing an example of how actually social investment becomes actually um, uh, instrumental for, for, for good business. Um, that being said, you know, these are brilliant examples. Uh, these are enlightened and I think frontliners, uh, 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 players in the business sectors. Uh, we know that not all businesses are quite there. Um, uh, and that's why UNICEF really work with business partners, uh, whether they're companies, aggregators, uh, industry platforms uh, to really promote sustainable business uh, and positive impact uh, on children's rights and the integration on children's rights into business policies and practices. Um, so the question around uh, uh, BMS uh, or baby food and uh, you know the intersection between business practices and nutrition, uh, it's an area where actually our work uh, um, um, focus a lot on what Dina was mentioning now, the need for uh, conducive uh, uh, policies uh, at national level uh, to really influence uh, business practices. But at the same time, we do not deny the dialogue and our active advocacy to business in this case to change their practices. The second concept is really around the importance of innovation. 
and the investment in social entrepreneurship and the nourishing of no local markets. Dina, you were very vocal about this and uh, UNICEF is really uh, working uh, extensively in this area, but also growing is, is work in this area. First, you know, like as a, uh, a buyer and a supplier ourselves, you know, like our supply division works uh, uh, a lot to enabling the access of basic products and services to children, especially uh, the most marginalized. And part of our work in our supply division is really to work with local suppliers and nourish local markets, because first of all, it's efficient <laughs> uh, in terms of, uh, um, of the whole mechanism. Secondly, also in the strong belief that uh, uh, nourishing local solutions actually enable uh, sustainability. And that's what we need to make that access uh, stand, um, lasting. And the second area is, uh, uh, you know, like our work in innovation. We have uh, uh, now an innovation department that is growing and is growing in scope and in geographies. Uh, and uh, there are two pillars of it that I think resonate a lot with what you were saying, uh, uh, Dina. The first is a venture pillar where, you know, like we have a UNICEF value fund designed to fund early stage open source technology um, uh, solutions. And, um, and the second pillar is uh, uh, the portfolio call to scale pillar that really works with country office and regional offices uh, to uh, support uh, uh, innovation driven by our um, countries uh, um, in the field uh, in specific thematic areas. So we have a, a WASH uh, portfolio, we have GIGA, which is um, our effort uh, to uh, con con in increase and ensure connectivities of all schools uh, and, and, and make accessible uh, edu digital education accessible. Um, and then there is uh, an area that is uh, around finance. And this brings to the third point that again was, was brought into the need of this system approach and the focus and importance for UNICEF itself to focus to focus on the enabling environment for on the enabling environment for social change, including the area of uh, of, uh, of invest investment and uh, and the financial sector. In this enabling environment, when it comes to business and the role of business in social transformation, we're working as I mentioned, you know, like on the policy area, really influencing policies uh, which uh, are related or, you know, like uh, um, are directed at uh, improving uh, sustainable business practices, but also working with the investor and the financial sector. Um, uh, what we call the child, line, child lens uh, um, investment. This is an area which we call innovative financing. And when we talk about child lights, child lands investing, we're really looking at the two areas: the destination of, uh, of, of investment, so driving investors uh, and asset managers and, and investment banks uh, to invest into uh, solutions for children, but also child rights, uh, lens, child in, lens invest as a as a lens to use in the process of invest of, of investment. So really. Uh, designing criteria and standards uh, to make sure that investment um, chooses companies uh, with a certain level of sustainability or the commitment to reach to a certain level of, account of uh, sustainability. I stopped there because I could speak for two hours about that, uh, but <laughs> I want to leave the space uh, to the discussion, to the question, and I really thank uh, the panel and, and all participants. This was great, and I'm sorry if I will have to leave before the session closes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carlotta. We spoke about committed workforces uh, and clearly the passion that our team has. And Carlotta leads the team on business engagement and child rights. Um, it, you can see clearly see uh, how passionate we are about the work that we do. So thank you so much for bringing all of those elements in, Carlotta, for UNICEF's work. We have time um, just for two quick reflections. Um, and I have two people here who want to make a point and then we're going to go, we're going to go and uh, do a bit of wrap up. So Stephanie. Thank you. Hi, uh, Stephanie from Population Media Center. Um, regarding, um, Dina, you mentioned this, um, you know, working together in pursuit of progress and the world we don't yet live in. Um, the SPC sector, all of the experts here and in the sector on social, you know, working on uh, social changes that are truly critical and urgent for societies around the world. Um, our sector is in the business of tackling the system and society disruption that will lead to that world we don't yet live in. And I'm, I'm not sure that all 
market driven needs and consumer appetites represent steps towards that that world um, as they are largely driven by markets and societies built on and propagating attitudes and behaviors that we are working to change for the better. Can you reflect on how the business sector can and should follow the guidance and lead of the SBC sector to aim higher in how they wield their great influence uh, over society and societal change? Dina, just wait one minute. We're gonna take the second question and then we'll come back to you. Thank you. So I'm gonna to go to Noreen who's gonna ask another question. Yeah, actually, it, it is so much related to what you started. I'm glad that I'm after you. And my question is, you know, I mean, it's it's just a reflection because I'm I'm thinking about those because I'm Noreen Nakpi and I'm working in uh, SBC emergencies. So you know, my my point is really for those we have not yet reached. So my question is that how is the corporate sector going to use the influence that they have? Um, to really reach out to those who are not really their consumers as such, just recipients of uh, humanitarian aid. How do we flip from just receiving the aid and poor people out there in disaster to part of this um, accountability that and responsibility that we all have, especially the corporate sector, mm -hmm. because they have the influence. And how do we, the second part of this question is that how can we also influence some social norms and behaviors, not looking at it from the product perspective, like not selling the soap, oh, soap is going to wash your hands and you are good, but really looking at it from the other side. So I just want to, for example, you can use your influence um, talking about child marriage also. Mm -hmm. You can use your influence about other gender discrimination that has been happening and you have the influence. Um, you have the influence over governments also and the policies. So, I mean, this is a little bit of reflection. I'm, I'm not really expecting a concrete answer, but I just want all of us to really start thinking about that. Thank you. Okay, both very good questions. And because I'm aware of some of the work that, for example, Tata's have been doing around this issue of reaching those that are not the direct consumers, but are the most marginalized and challenging some very important basic issues, uh, such as child marriage or things like that. I'm going to go to Sora. Um, Sora is joined. I, Sora, is that you on the iPhone? Because we, uh, I, I just want to confirm that it's you who's connected. Sora, can you hear us? No. Okay. So Saurav is not with us, um, but maybe we can get him to respond to your uh, question a little bit. Maybe do you want to come in here, Hilda, and share a little bit? Um, well, I I think we we do try try to drive um, social change, um, and we we are aware of of our influence, and it does go beyond um, the products. It's it's the way in which um, we um, um, join. Um, business, um, other business organizations work with businesses together. For example, on, on climate change, we're part of uh, We Mean Business, um, we're part of um, the climate group, and, and we are trying to um, influence um, policy. We, we, we were present at um, COP27 um, and really kind of driving for the phase out um, of fossil fuels, for example. But Obviously, we can't tackle every single social issue there is. Um, so, so, so we we do have to um, make make uh, make uh, choices. But but we are aware of of our our, our influence and and we try to to use it um, for the better. I'm afraid I I, I really can't answer your, your question on humanitarian aid just because I don't know uh, much about it really. So sorry, sorry. about that. <laughs> All right, what I'm going to do is, because uh, Stephanie asked a question to Dina. Dina, I'm going to, can we request you to respond to what Stephanie was saying and the point she was making? And maybe we can wrap up because we are at the hour. But some of us in the room, if you want to continue the conversation, we have tea and coffee outside the session and maybe some of these conversations we can take outside the room. But Dina, I'm going to let you have the last word on this one then. <laughs> I really want to have the last word, but it's 3 a.m. And I was hoping Stephanie could repeat her question again very quickly. So it's over to you, Dina. Go ahead, have the last word. Rania, can you can you repeat what the question was? The first question again. Sorry, I'm I'm sorry. 
<laughs> sure, no problem. Um, so in terms of the world we don't yet live in um, and how much, yeah, I'm not necessarily sure that the market-driven needs and consumer appetites represent steps towards that world as they are largely driven by yeah. markets and, and societies built on and propagating attitudes and behaviors that we're working to change for the better. Um, yeah. So yeah. as the SBC sector is an expert in really highlighting and, and pushing for those changes, can you reflect on how the business sector can and should follow the guidance and lead of the SBC sector in aiming higher to- Yeah, you know, hey, I got it. Rates? Thank you so much. Sorry, I apologize. Again, 3 a.m. <laughs> um, I I think I just, just to wrap up and also, I think it just to also talk about the point on um, what, business can do to influence. I think it's important to remember that this, this space of the role of business in society really is not that old of a space. I, I think it's, it's been a continuum and it's been a journey. Um, and I think there, there are a couple of things that I, that I want to draw attention to. One, uh, we focus a lot on the business and the behavior of business. I think we should also equally be focusing on the role of the consumer and the role of the user and the, the incredible agency they have to demand change within the business sector. So I, I, I'm a big believer that we will see massive change within the business sector if their consumers demand it, because if they don't respond to what consumers want to see and want to see as behavioral change within the private sector, they won't survive and they won't be able to give profits back to their shareholders and so forth and so on. And I do also, uh, I think I think it's also important um, to, to think through a little bit. And I was talking to Rania about this this morning. I, I'm not sure that we do a great job as educators either within business schools. And I think there's a lot of work to be done when it comes to business education and uh, the kind of students we are graduating who are starting businesses, who are working in multinationals and large companies. I, I have to say, I think, frankly, within business schools, um, you, you don't see uh, social behavior change as a cross-cutting theme throughout every class. If you're lucky, you'll get a class on like business ethics or a class on social entrepreneurship. When in reality, we need to be educating students on what this means within every class they take, preparing them to enter the business world. And I think we need, I think there needs to be a much bigger focus on, on education and what needs to be integrated in education and what needs to be embedded as something that needs to be a part of curriculum across the board, because I don't think we're preparing, um, I don't think we're creating the kind of uh, leaders we need for the future. And I think that's an incredibly important point. I think the last thing I will say is that change is very, very, very difficult. And um, when we ask for behavioral change, we have to really recognize that with that comes a lot of fear. And when I say fear, I mean fear of loss because when we're behaving a certain way, we're, we're used to something, we're used to seeing uh, things being done a certain way to move away from that. Even if we know that that change is going to lead to more positive change and uh, what, will, what will lead to a much better um, outcome for society, there will inevitably be losses and we need to be talking about how 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 the private sector can think through um, some of those losses by focusing and reframing everything on all of the gains that will happen from significant behavioral change and i think you know le leadership is a really um it's a very difficult thing and uh i think anybody who chooses to step up and lead specifically when it comes to uh, really transforming the role of the private sector in business, that is a, a true adaptive challenge because there are so many complex nuances in place when it comes to the private sector. Uh, and I think we need to really focus on how, how we can allow the private sector to overcome their fear of some of the losses that they think will be incurred to really adopt the benefits and the, the tra transformational changes that will happen to the world for the better. 
Thank you so much, Dina. And thank you so much for your, your honesty and forwardness as well, because I think, you know, those are spaces that are also very challenging for us to engage in um, and, and to even have those conversations with business sector. So, I mean, there's so much that you already said. I, I don't want to, you know, um, requote your nuggets because they were very important. I think, you know, in the space of engaging with um, education of entrepreneurs, that's, you know, something that we are definitely not um, working in whatsoever. But yes, it's a journey. A change is a very long term journey. And I think that, you know, in, in reflecting on this and how we move forward, there's so many entry points. So thank you so much for everything that you just said. And thank you to the entire panel. Thank you, Prachi. Um, we did lose Saurav. Um, thank you, Hilde. Um, I'm going to, like, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I feel like there's so much that we need to keep talking. And so this is just the first step. I, I want to introduce Vincent just for two minutes, just because I think it's, it would be great to hear from you about your reflections on the session and moving forward. Over to you, Vincent. <clears throat> Thank you. That's quite the morning gift. <laughs> I have six pages of this to make sense of. Um, my name is Vincent. I'm the chief of the SBC section in UNICEF headquarters. So very subjective takeaways. Um, I'm frustrated by the conversation, which is probably a good sign. Uh, I mean, we should spend the day talking to these people and we should probably have many more days doing it. So I guess that's uh, objective achieved in that sense. Um, I'll start realization. Maybe we can't do without the private sector to achieve the SDGs. I think that's one of the key takeaway. I mean, big picture, that's, that's where it is. Um, we're working through systems. The private sector is one of the systems. There is no way around it, so we need to partner. Um, potential levers and entry points that I thought were striking, uh, the reach, the scale. I mean, Unilever, you said 3.4 billion people. I, when I studied, actually, people told me that everybody has at least three Unilever products in their house. I studied in agronomy and in food production, so I remember that. It's, it's still from quite a while ago, so that's, that's for the rich. I think the fact that the workforce itself is asking for the purpose and the CSR doesn't necessarily come from the, um, the business leads was also, to me, an important entry point. And then um, what we said about the World Economic Forum and the Alliance of Clean Air as um, uh, positive deviants or influencers or frontliners. So we have obviously some companies here that are probably on the, I don't want to draw a line, but probably on, if I were to draw a line, okay, I'm not going to draw a line. Let's say we have frontliners. <coughs> Questions have been raised about the fossil fuel industry, about the, you know, the mining industry, the plastic industry. Like how do we also use those who are committed to try and do a bit better to maybe impact those who have a bigger impact on the issues that we're trying to solve um, that leads me to a few of the commonalities that I've noticed between our worlds, which are interesting. Um, using positive deviants and influencers is something that we do. I think the focus on trying to um, build the young people's skills for innovation, entrepreneurship, I mean, that's something we all want to do, uh, something we probably can rally around. And then the science of behavior change, you know, the framework about easy, desirable, rewarding, that reminds me of the East framework, the easy, attractive, social, and timely. We have the same tools. I have a feeling you're better than we are at applying them um, to changing behaviors. Uh, we're probably a bit better at thinking about social change. Uh, so maybe, you know, there is an exchange there to be, to be had somehow. Um, quickly, thanks for the concrete advice, Dina, about engaging funds managers um, and engaging business schools um, you know, taking into account how many hundreds of people they influence. I think that's a very concrete recommendation that I am taking away. Um, and I'll finish on the more difficult conversations, I guess. Um, you know, some of us are not always convinced by the narratives. I think there are expectations to, uh, for businesses to speak up about child rights, um, not just child rights, I mean, women's rights, human rights in general. Right? I heard mentions of child labor. That's a conversation I would like to have. Um, I think we are you know, in our mindset, inequities, rights, uh, ethics are things that we would like to discuss more. Um, curious to see how you monitor your target. You know, you you told us, someone told us, I know, I think it's you, Hilda, uh, that you have specific targets that you monitor. I'd be very curious to be looking at that. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, to me, the main conclusion is we need more platforms like this. I mean, we need a continued dialogue. We need to do that all the time. Thank you for being here. Thanks very much. So with that, I think we will wrap up and say thank you so much. Thank you for you know staying and engaging with us and to be continued. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.